This video is a continuation in our series on the spinal cord. And this video is going to be an introduction to reflexes. So let's define a reflex. A reflex is an involuntary stereotyped response to a stimulus. Many times this is going to remove your body from harm. Or reflexes can have some other protective kind of action and we're going to see a couple of those here in a second. We have four properties of reflexes. We're going to see many of these properties reflected in our definition of a reflex. So here our first property is that we require stimulation. Our reflexes are not spontaneous actions. They occur in response to a stimulus. So in our two pictures, our reflex hammer here hitting our patellar tendon is the stimulus. Or in our bottom picture, it's our dim light versus our bright light. Reflexes are very quick. They generally only involve a few neurons so that we can reduce our synaptic delay and remove our body from harm in a very quick manner. Next, our reflexes are involuntary. They do not require the brain to send the signal for movement. In fact, our brain is not even aware of the action that we have taken until after that action has been carried out. And finally, our reflexes are stereotyped, meaning they occur in the exact same way every single time they happen. So one of our reflexes is called a withdraw reflex. And you've experienced this if you've ever put your hand on something very hot, then you immediately pull your hand away in order to prevent from getting burned. Now, when you pull your hand away, that's gonna happen the exact same way every time you put your hand on, on something hot. So for example, one time you put your hand on something hot, you may pull your hand away. Well, the next time you put your say, hand on something hot, you're not gonna push your hand further onto the hot object. You're gonna pull it away every single time. Now, while these last two bullets are not properties of reflexes, they are something I want to explain before we keep going. We have somatic reflexes, which involve skeletal muscle. So our skeletal muscle is going to be our effector. And then we have visceral reflexes, which involve smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, or adipose tissue. So all of our effectors are going to either be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, or adipose tissue. So you should see the same split here that we have for our somatic nervous system versus our visceral nervous system or our autonomic nervous system. So here in the picture with our reflex hammer, we are using skeletal muscle as our effectors, and so this is going to be a somatic reflex. Whereas in this picture down here, the muscles in our eye are smooth muscles, and so this is going to be a visceral reflex. Now I wanna go over the components of a generalized somatic reflex arc. Our first component is going to be a somatic receptor. Our somatic receptor is gonna be located in our skin, our skeletal muscles, or any of the structures of our joints, which could be tendons, ligaments, or our joint capsules. Second, we have our afferent nerve fiber, which is going to carry our information into the posterior gray horn of our spinal cord. At that posterior gray horn, our sensory fiber is going to synapse to an integrating center. Our integrating center is going to be located in our spinal cord or in our brain stem, and it's going to receive the sensory input and decide what to do with it by sending out motor commands. And this may involve one or more interneurons. Our efferent nerve is then going to carry our motor signal to our effector, and then our effector is going to remove our body from harm or carry out our response. 
So when we look at our generalized reflex arc, we are going to use all of these components. The very first thing that happens is the arrival of a stimulus at our receptor. In this case, it is going to be a pain receptor. We have put our hand down onto attack. So we stimulate our receptor, which carries that pain information into our spinal cord, where we synapse to an interneuron, and that interneuron tells our motor fiber to remove our hand from the tack, and we have carried out our reflex. We're going to talk about specific reflexes in later videos. Next, we're going to look at how reflexes can be classified. So I like this chart because it tells us reflexes can be classified by development, response, complexity of circuit, and by processing site. Well, we have already discussed by response by defining our somatic and our visceral reflexes. And all we mean there is that in a somatic reflex, we are using skeletal muscles to carry out the actions. And in visceral reflexes, we are using smooth or cardiac muscles, glands, and adipose tissue to carry out the reflex. By processing site is fairly easy. All we need to know is where is our interneuron located. So where is our interneuron located? Is it located in our spinal cord, in which case it will be a spinal reflex, or is it located in our brain stem? And you're gonna notice I added stem on there because we're not involving just our brain, it's gonna be our brain stem. Remember, reflexes occur without involvement of the brain. So if our processing site is in the brain stem, then we have a cranial reflex. Now I want to look at reflexes by development and define innate versus acquired reflexes. Innate reflexes are reflexes that you are born with. So the word innate means that you are born with that quality, that characteristic, whatever you're talking about. But because you are born with these reflexes, they do not need to be learned. If you dunk a baby into a swimming pool, that baby is naturally going to hold its breath because we don't breathe water. And uh, so baby being in a pool when it cannot swim is a bad thing, but if the baby's head accidentally goes under, they're not going to breathe in water because they automatically hold their breath without having to learn that. In this bottom picture, we have many different innate reflexes that are really pretty cool to uh, try out on babies. And you may be familiar with a couple of these. If you tap the baby right above the nasal bridge, that baby is going to close its eyes. If you put your finger on a baby's cheek, they are going to turn towards that finger uh, to look for something to suck on, and so forth and so on. So your innate reflexes, you're born with them, and they do not need to be learned. This is opposed to our acquired reflexes, which you learn as you grow and practice your motions. When I was in junior high, I learned how to play the flute, and I played the flute all the way through the end of high school. And I, so that's many, many moons ago, but if I picked up a flute, I could still play you an F scale. That's because I played so many F scales over the seven years of junior high and high school that that muscle memory is ingrained and embedded in my reflexes. So our acquired or our learned reflexes are gonna be our muscle memory. So the more you practice something like learning how to throw a curveball the better you get at that motion because your cerebellum is going to refine your movements and it's going to make the most precise movements that it can 
And that practice of refining those movements is creating that muscle memory and creating that acquired reflex. So our last way that we can classify reflexes is by complexity. So we can say a reflex is monosynaptic, mono meaning one, and so we only have one synapse and our sensory neuron synapses directly to our motor neuron. Whereas in a polysynaptic reflex, we have more than one synapse. Generally, what this means is you have an interneuron in the reflex or you have more than one interneurons in your reflex. And we're going to see examples of those when we go through some of our reflexes. So if you have any questions regarding the properties of a reflex or how reflexes can be classified, please do not hesitate to contact your instructor.